Today I'm joined by Stephen Gilbo. Stephen is a deputy director of uh, the Canadian NGO Equitaire. Uh, it was reported, Stephen, that uh, Canada will formally leave the Kyoto Protocol at the end of this year. Was it a great shock for Canadian NGOs and uh, the Canadian public to hear about this uh, decision? I would like to tell you that it was a shock to Canadian NGOs and the public. Unfortunately, since 2006, since our Conservative government has have taken power, uh, they've done nothing to, to help Canada achieve its Kyoto commitment. In fact, they, they, they cut funding for renewable energy, energy efficiency, public education on climate change, um, and increased funding uh, for tar sands development, uh, tax breaks for carbon capture and storage. So they're really going in the wrong direction. They've been one of the worst player here in terms of the international negotiations on climate change, received several fossil of the day and even fossil of the year award for four consecutive years. So no, it wasn't a surprise. It is still disappointing to see that they would do this and that they would do they were planning to come here for two weeks and, and pretend that they were negotiating in good faith uh, while what they really want to do is just leave the table and, they, and they're planning to announce this on the eve of Christmas. So does it make any difference now that Canada is leaving the process? Well, I, I think, I mean, clearly we want an international agreement with all major emitters around the table. And despite the fact that Canada is a small country in terms of population or economy, we are a large emitter. We're among the 10 largest emitters of greenhouse gas on the planet, not per capita, not per unit of GDP, but overall we're one of the 10 largest. So we are a big part of the problem. I mean, it's not just China or India, it's not just the US or Europe either. I mean, we're part of this and we would want Canada to be a proactive player, a proactive country at the negotiating table. Unfortunately, it seems that with this government, this is something that will be impossible to achieve. All right, let's see. And, uh Against this background, what kind of message would you like to see the European governments and also the developing countries give to the uh, Canadian delegation here at COP17 in Durban? Well, it wouldn't be the first time where the Canadians of this Canadian government has said that it would do something and then under international pressure change its mind. So the same thing happened in, in, in Bali four years ago. They were opposing a decision on the, on the Kyoto Protocol track negotiation and under intense international pressure during the Bali meeting, they decided to stop blocking consensus. I think that if the European Union countries, if, if developing nations started standing up here in in Durban, started asking questions about Canada's position, starting even criticizing what, what Canada is doing and how irresponsible it is in light of the IEA report two weeks ago, in light of the, the, the new IPCC report around the link the linkages between global warming and extreme weather events. And, and even in Canada, we have analysis by government agencies that's, that say that oh, just 10 years from now, the cost, of, uh, the cost of adaptation to climate change will be in the billions of dollars per year in a country like Canada. So uh, I think they need to hear this from as many countries as possible. And who knows, we, we might be able to change their minds. Let's hope so. One last question. You already mentioned tar sands. What role do you think tar sands have played in Canada's decision to leave the process? Over the last five years, Canada has basically become a petrostate, an oil state. Uh, our government is in bed with oil companies. Uh, we've made several access to information requests showing that our international strategy, uh, for example, lobbying the European Union on the fuel quality directive, well, that strategy was elaborated by the oil industry and delivered by the government. The talking points were, were produced by the oil industry in Canada and delivered by, by civil servants, by, by federal ministers, by the, by the Prime Minister of Canada. So our energy policy, our international positions on issues like climate change, uh, energy development, are now dictated in Canada by, by the oil industry. And, and you would think, listening to the Conservative government in Canada, that oil is 50% of our economy and everybody depends on it. It's only 5% of the economy. And it's amazing to see that they're totally obsessed by that and forgetting the, the, the other 95% of the economy, which is, in some cases, industries in my own state, in Quebec, have achieved and surpassed the Kyoto targets. They're in fact, they've reduced their emissions by 25% under 1990 levels since 1990. 
while they double their production. So we can be prosperous, we can grow in terms of a, in terms of a state, in terms of a nation, while reducing our emissions, but clearly the Conservative government of Canada cannot understand that right now. Okay, thank you so much, Stephen, for your time.